Genesis 37, verses 18 to 20. Let's go. Now, when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, Look, this dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit, and we shall say, Some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. I title this, Here Comes the Dreamer. Here Comes the Dreamer. Wife of a former U.S. president, Eleanor Roosevelt, made a statement that has become very famous all over the world, very inspiring. She said, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. When I read Genesis 37, the experience of Joseph, I like to ask each person, how do you respond to the challenges of your life? The reality is no one lives a perfect life. The enchanted fairy tale life where they live happily ever after, everything works perfectly, is the work of fiction. When we see you know, people's lives looking well and looking together, there's always a tendency for us to assume that it's because life has dealt them a better hand than life has dealt us. Um, like people say, the, the grass always seems greener on the other side. Yeah, but uh, hmm. when, when you, you become mature, you realize that the grass is looking greener there because somebody is removing the weeds. There are weeds there too. They're dealing with issues <laughs> there also. Okay? In Joseph's case, he was born the 11th son of his father, had an older sister and 10 brothers. And uh, the Bible says that his father loved him. Maybe that was a mistake from his father's end, having a favorite child, you know, developed envy and hatred from his brothers. His father even made him a tunic, a coat of many colors. So his brothers didn't like him. They hated him. And when I read there in Genesis 37, I observe how he dealt with it. Let me read, for example, from verse 3, Genesis 37 from verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Verse 5. Now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers. See, in the face of adversity, someone said, some develop wings, others go for crutches. See, everybody has challenges. For some, their challenges become the excuse for failure. Their handicap, whatever it may be, it may be financial, it may be physical, okay? It may be relationship-wise, Maybe they don't have social connections. It may be in terms of their family status or social status. But everybody has some handicap somewhere. Nobody has everything. Uh, it, it may have to do with education. Okay? Some people use those handicaps as crutches. That is, what to lean on. Okay? As an excuse for not fulfilling or realizing their potentials. But then there are some others who look within themselves and then leverage on the gift that we said that God gave us, our imagination. And they create new dimensions, create new realms for themselves, new levels. Because in the realm of imagination, we said there is no limitation or there are no limitations. In the realm of imagination, all things are possible. 
in the realm of imagination, you can shift to a new level. You can become a new person entirely. And that's exactly what Joseph did. In terms of bad order in his family, he was disadvantaged. He had 10 older brothers harassing him every single day. But in the realm of his imagination, he was free enough to escape those limitations and harassment. Joseph had a dream. I believe that he must have prayed. God had a plan for his life like God had a plan for each of his brothers. They didn't focus on their own plans. Their problem now was with that of the young man. They hated him. He had a dream. I think that's how to respond to any challenge. You're experiencing lack and deprivation. In the realm of your imagination, ascend to a new level. Leave this realm of scarcity, go into the realm of abundance. In the physical, you know, your status is low. In your imagination, become a CEO. When you read in Genesis 39, continuing on the story of Joseph, the Bible says there that he was in Potiphar's house and that the Lord was with him and caused whatever he did to prosper. Genesis 39 verse 2 challenged me many years ago when I was studying it. It said, and Joseph, now I was reading in King James Version. It said, and Joseph was a prosperous man. And I, I was struggling with that because verse 1 just said that Potiphar bought him from the slave market. Then verse 2 said he was a prosperous man. So I said, Lord, I don't get it. <laughs> How was he a prosperous man? He wasn't even an employee of Potiphar. He was Potiphar's property. Potiphar bought him from the slave market. And then you said he was a prosperous man. I said, Lord, where did he get the prosperity from? He couldn't have been a prosperous man. In the New King James Version, it says he was a successful man. Either of them. None adds up. So the Holy Spirit said to me, look, I can't be wrong. You must be the one who has a problem. Read it again. So I read it. And the Lord was with Joseph. And he was a prosperous man. I said, Lord, that's what I'm saying. He, can't, he couldn't even have a bank account. If he owned the bank account himself and the bank account would be the property of Potiphar. So where did he get the prosperity from? The Holy Spirit said, read it again. Just know that I can't be wrong. Read it again. But read it slowly. I said, okay. And the Lord was with Joseph. Yes. And he was, he said, stop. That's where it is. I didn't say that he had prosperity. I said he was. Those are two different levels, isn't it? Okay? His status on the outside was slave. But that was not who he was. Inside him, he was prime minister. And he didn't let go of that. So, so you would understand why he walked with excellence the way he did. He, he walked from the inside out. Because his identity was not the label that they placed on him on the outside. How do you respond to the challenges of your life? How do you respond to the fact that you live in a, in a developing country? How do you respond to the fact that you live in an environment where there are a lot of limitations? Your opportunity is your imagination. It's in your dreams. And Joseph dreamed, and Joseph had a dream. In that dream, he said that himself and his brothers were in the field binding sheaves. And that somewhere along the line, their own sheaves bowed down to his own. Hallelujah. Harass me in the physical. I'm waiting for you in the spiritual. You have control over today. With the help of God, I'm influencing my tomorrow. The equation will change. Amen. Amen. See, that's why they say that without a dream, you are sunk. Because the dreams of today are the realities of tomorrow. Our dreams are the raw materials with which the Holy Spirit constructs our future realities. 
So, <clears throat> uh, um, when, when Joseph shared his dream to his brothers, the Bible says that they hated him even more for his dreams. <laughs> Let me read that. Verse 5, now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. Okay, he told them the dream. Uh, uh, verse 8, and his brothers said to him, shall you indeed reign over us or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Verse 9, then he dreamed still another dream. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Woo! See, the harder the situation becomes, the bigger your dreams should be. Be not conformed to this world. Never allow the realities on the outside to shape your inner realities. You get into a bind. You got to have a dream. A dream will alter your sense of identity. A dream will alter your sense of identity. It will redefine who you are. So, in the physical, Joseph was 11th son. Yes, he was disadvantaged. They called him all sorts of names because the Bible said they didn't speak kind words to him. But in his dream, his identity was redefined. He was prime minister in his dream. So who are you? Who can you be? Okay? Who can you be? A dream from God will redefine your identity. It will give you a new self-image. Give you a new picture of yourself. Watch out for the dreamer. His or her confession will change. Jesus said in John 10 verse 30, I and my father are one. People wanted to stone him. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when as a young man, God was giving me dreams, giving me visions of the future, and I declared them. I mean, they were so unreal. Now, you tell some people your dreams, they say it's unrealistic. But that's a confirmation, isn't it? If it was realistic, it would not be a dream. Dreams are made of unrealistic stuff. Amen. <laughs> dreams are made of unrealistic stuff. A dream from God will give you a new self-image, give you a new picture in your heart about who you are. And that means you have a new level of self-esteem because self-esteem is how you feel about yourself. Thank you, Lord. You can't see yourself as prime minister and be feeling like a victim. See, it doesn't matter what you may be going through today. Like Joseph, you know it's temporary. You tell yourself, this one too will pass. Amen. <laughs> this one too will pass. This is not the real me. Okay, this is today. This is not tomorrow. This is temporary reality. This is not ultimate. A dream will redefine your identity. I stand here this morning and I'm absolutely confident of the fact that I'm speaking to someone who is a governor. Yeah. I'm speaking to a CEO of a multinational corporation yeah. that will manufacture cars. Yeah. Okay? I'm, <laughs> you know, there may be someone who is called Clark now. Yet, the reality is you are a CEO flying all over the world Amen. to do business. Amen. Amen. A dream redefines your identity. See, because of the dream that I have for this church, when I stand here, I do so with a sense of responsibility. When I prepare to preach, when I pray, I'm conscious of the fact that I am speaking to world-class leaders. I'm speaking to global leaders, so I don't take it lightly. Each service for me is a global leadership conference. Amen. Amen. I'm speaking to history makers, Amen. nation shakers, Amen. men and women of influence. Amen. If you believe that, say amen. I'm just... Amen. 
trying to help you to see it. <laughs> a dream will alter your sense of identity. Number two, a dream will define your destination, which will determine your direction. A dream will define your destination, and that will determine your direction. This is important. See, once God began to give me dreams that defined my destination in life, I was studying for something else. I was on a different trajectory. Once I prayed, just because I had a sermon from my pastor from Luke 12, 34, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. He said, God has put your treasure in life somewhere. Pray that God should show you where it is so you can put your heart there. And I prayed as a student, an engineering student, and the Holy Spirit told me, you'll never be a contractor. You will be a pastor. <laughs> Remember, that defined it for me. Defines your destination. You don't make real progress without your destination in life defined. They don't sell flight tickets to people who don't know where they are flying to. Yeah, you don't fly. You may walk, you may crawl, you may run, but you don't fly if you've not decided your destination. And some people focus more on their speed. Their speed through life. They want to go fast through life. So by the age of 25, they want to be driving a Lamborghini. Now, of what use is your speed when you don't know where you are going? A dream from God defines your destination and that defines or determines also your direction. Because once your destination is defined, wisdom tells you every road can take you there. A dream will give you hope and motivation. A dream will give you hope and motivation. You have a reason to wake up in the morning and to jump down from the bed because you are going somewhere. It may not be apparent to everybody else, but you have a reason for living. Once hope is completely extinguished from a person's life, the person is dead. That's why people commit suicide. But when God gives you a dream, he has defined your tomorrow. That keeps you going. Any negative situation you know is temporary. And then next, a dream will discipline you. A dream will discipline you. It will control your behavior. Joseph's dream gave him discipline. If you've seen yourself in leadership, there are things you know you don't want to do today because they will impact on you tomorrow. There's a reason why you have to read, why you have to study, why you have to take those exams. Discipline. There's a reason why you can't just eat anything, go anywhere, associate with just anybody, and do just anything because you know there are things you will do and you will never be able to arrive at your destination. A dream will discipline you. My encouragement today, because I have a short time, you want to see your dream realized, write down your dream. Write it down. Write it down. Many people have dreams, and they are frustrated because their dreams are not being fulfilled. I'll tell you the power in writing your dreams. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. I will set myself upon the watch, see what the Lord will say to me, what I will answer when I am reproved. Verse 2, and the Lord answered me and said, write the vision. A, a dream is unreal. It's a spiritual reality. How do you bring it down? Writing is the first opportunity that your dream has to make contact with the physical world. Don't let keep it hanging. Let it make contact with the physical world. That's why those of us who are in cultures that are very poor in writing make very little progress. If you want to draw spiritual realities down into the physical, once you start writing, you create a contact, a connection between the spiritual world and the physical. Write down your dream. Number two, declare your dream. Declare your dream. Say it out. Some people read the story of Joseph. They say, oh, it was because his brothers had him, you know, talking about his dreams. That's why they hated him and eventually sold him off to be a slave. 
but I would rather that he said his dreams than that he didn't say his dreams. Maybe what you need to do is to be careful who you share your dreams with. Mm -hmm. Be careful who you are talking to. Because some people are dream killers. But you've got to say it. When God had a dream for our world in Genesis chapter 1, he spoke his dreams into manifestation, into reality. Say it. Words are seeds. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. There is creative power in words. Words never die. You release them. God said, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void. You release them. They go into the realm of the spirit. They shape the material world. Speak those words. I look back to them and I thank God that I had the courage to speak my dreams when it didn't make sense. I have the courage to tell people I'm not a local champion. I'm a world champion. I'm going to the world. I was in the backside of the desert, an unemployed graduate, and I was bragging. I'm going to the world. And some people couldn't see the road from where I was to the world. <laughs> they couldn't see the road. But this guy is crazy. I would rather be crazy and have my dreams fulfilled than stay with those timid souls who are afraid to take a step or to make a bold declaration. Declare your dream. Next, develop your character. Develop your character. Become the person in the dream. Develop your character. You need strong values to fulfill a dream. Strong values. You need to ask yourself, what do I need to do? What do I need to prioritize? Wisdom will tell you, you don't have all the time in the world, you don't have all the money in the world, you don't have all the resources in the world. You will have to focus your resources on some specific areas to achieve your goals. You have to focus your time, focus your money, focus your relationships, focus whatever it is you want to do. Focus your educational pursuits on a narrow area because you can't be everything. That's why you need to have strong values. And your values will determine your choices and control your behavior. Develop character. Next, develop your gifts. Joseph had character. Strong character, strong values. He had opportunity to mess up. He did not because he had a future. And then he developed his gifts. Your gifts are those enablements God has given you to, be, to add value to your world. Locate your gifts. Locate your talents. There was a connection between Joseph's talents and his dream. There was a connection. The ability to interpret dreams and leadership, or management and leadership skills. Joseph had them. The door opener was always interpretation of dreams. So you need to even categorize your gifts and know which one is the door opener. What are the opportunities that come most easily to you? It's very interesting how, especially in a, in a poor environment like ours, people are just focused on what to do to earn a salary to eat. Life is more than eating, sir. Life is more than eating. Life is more than eating. Okay? So some people invest their most valuable resources, especially their time, on survival. Come on. Locate your gift and develop it to world standard. Be the best in your world in the area of your gift. And then serve faithfully and maximize every opportunity. 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 Serve faithfully. Start small. Think big. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Dream big, but start small. It is foolishness to want to start big. Why? Most people don't start perfectly. Practice makes perfect. So when you make your mistakes, it's better to make your mistakes with small money. And then it's better to make your mistakes anonymously. 
Make your mistakes when nobody knows you. Amen. It's just wisdom. Some people want to come out big. When they fall, they fall big. Start small. Think big. Start small. Don't despise the day of small things. The day of small beginnings. They have value, sir. They have value. Jesus said, if you have not been faithful in little, nobody will give you much to oversee. If you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who will give you your own? That's what Jesus said. Too many unrealistic dreamers. Just because you have a big dream, you have to start. Listen, if Joseph was thinking like that, he would have missed his best chances in life. He was in Potiphar's house. Listen, in the midst of hardship, in the midst of misery, in the midst of your challenges, there are certain things God allows to happen to you and certain things he does not allow to happen to you. If it's the one who gave you the dream. It is involved in your life. All the while. No mistakes. The brothers of Joseph discussed about killing him. God stepped in. One of them said, no, 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 he's our blood. It would be a very a bad thing will happen to us if we kill Don't let us kill him. That was God intervening. Listen, until your dream is fulfilled, nobody can kill you. If the dream is from God, I'm telling you, nobody's going to kill you because God doesn't lie. If you line up with that dream, a dream will preserve your life. It's a good one to add. A dream will preserve your life. It was God that intervened. Then they saw some people coming, some merchants coming who were going to Egypt. Somebody said, let us sell him. All of them agreed. They sold him. That's how he found himself in Egypt. And those traders sold him to Potiphar. Listen, Potiphar was not the only person who came to the market to buy a slave that day. How come it was a top government official that bought him? No mistakes, sir. No coincidences. In the midst of everything, God is still working. The prison that he went was not the prison that everybody in Egypt went. It was one reserved for executives. <laughs> That's why he met the butler and the baker of the king there. It wasn't just any other prison. Mm. So even when you think you have a problem, it's a special problem. You need to understand and appreciate. <laughs> Okay, so Joseph didn't say, oh, a slave, who am I? And then do a poor job in Potiphar's house. He did a good job. In the prison, he gave his best. And then he served his fellow prisoners. Who would have known? How would he have known? But it was the person he served in prison that mentioned his name in the palace two years later. There are no small opportunities, sir. I know we live in a country now where a lot of young people are deceived. And they're looking for ideal opportunities. Ideal, listen, your ideal opportunity is the one you have now. There are no small opportunities in life. Some people are looking for the big break. They're not faithful where they are now. They're cheating. Cheating on the time, cheating the employer. They're cheating on their parents. And then they're looking for the big break. Then they come for anointing service. You're wasting your time, I'm telling you. The anointing won't work. Anointing won't work. Your anointing will turn to annoyance. <laughs> you, it, you've got to line up with God's principles. However small you think it is, your current opportunity is your best opportunity. Serve faithfully and maximize every opportunity. Leave the rest to God. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that in this season, the God who promised us new visions, new dreams, it will open your inner eyes. You will see things you've never seen before. You will hear things you've never heard before. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, as we celebrate 18 years of the fulfillment of a dream God gave us many years ago, I prophesy in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who has told us that there are new dreams he wants to give us new visions, I prophesy God will touch you deeply in your spirit. He will deposit revelations. Things that eyes have not seen, that ears have not heard, things that have never entered into the heart of any man. In the name of Jesus Christ. 
I pray for the person present in this service who says, Pastor Sam, well, the challenge is I don't even have a good relationship with God. Can I say a short prayer with you? Short prayer. Sin is man's greatest problem. I couldn't finish all my notes today. I was going to talk about how the state of your heart affects your capacity to fulfill dreams. Sin will destroy dreams in the heart of a human being. God sent his son Jesus to die for us on the cross many years ago. When we accept Jesus already paid on our behalf, God forgives us our sins. He removes sin from our hearts. I'm telling you, that's a revolution. That's a miracle. If you're that honest person, can you please put your hand on your heart? I want to say a short prayer with you. Very short prayer. Pastor Sam, I'm a sinner. My lifestyle is not right with God. I want God to forgive me my sins. Can you please put your hand on your heart? You may be here in the overflow. If you're watching on the internet, you may also put your hand on your heart. God bless you for your honesty. Perhaps you've been born again before. You've been a Christian before, but you have backslidden into sin. If Jesus comes today, or God forbid you die now, you appear before God, you are not absolutely sure you will make heaven. You want to rededicate your life to Jesus. Can you please also put your hand on your heart? God bless you. So if your hand is on your heart for this prayer, you are here or in the overflow, can you please stand by your chair? We'll be done in about one minute. Can you please stand? God bless you, sir. You didn't come to this service by accident. God brought you here. It's a life-changing moment. Life-changing. Every once in a while, we have an opportunity to make a choice. It is those choices that define your destiny. Can you please stand? If you are standing, please say this prayer after me. Dear God, I believe that Jesus paid for my sins. And I ask you to forgive me and to accept me as your child. Thank you for hearing my prayer in Jesus' name. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you for our brothers and sisters who are standing. So we ask that the power of the Holy Spirit should touch them. Thank you for forgiving their sins. We ask you to reveal yourself to them. Let them know you personally. And Father, help them to fulfill their destinies in Jesus' name.